In the second half of the 19th century, photography developed rapidly with the proliferation of photographic shops and then later in the 1880s with the invention of the Kodak camera. Well, this is a um, cartoon by Punch uh, showing some of the problems uh, of the uh, photographic shop portrait photograph. The problem was that the exposure time could still be in the minutes indoors. There were head clamps, but if there was any movement, faces would be blurred and distorted and the fine details lost. Nevertheless, Portrait photography became very popular as it meant that families that couldn't afford a painting could for the first time obtain a likeness of the family. Photographic shops expanded rapidly from a mere handful in the mid 1840s to 66 in 1855, 147 two years later. And for example, in London, the favourite street was Regent Street to go to to have your photograph taken. And at the peak in the mid 1860s, there were 42 photographic shops in Regent Street alone. The French poet Baudelaire, Charles Baudelaire, wrote, Our squalid society has rushed narcissist to a man to gloat at its trivial image on a scrap of metal. He was talking about the daguerreotype. Um, but there were um, other practical problems as well outside of the photographic shop. It was a very messy business. Things improved in 1851 because um, Frederick Scott Archer, an Englishman, discovered that collodion, which is... Um, cellulose nitrate dissolved in ether and alcohol could be used as an alternative to egg white on glass photographic plates and the big benefit of that was it to reduce the exposure time to a few seconds outside in bright sun. The method became known as the wet plate collodion or wet collodion method and it dominated photography for the next 30 years. However, as the plate had to be wet, the chemicals had to be applied to the plate immediately before the photograph was taken, and that had to be done in the dark. So, portable tents were invented and sold, and they tied around the photographer's waist to leave the photographer inside a portable dark room where the chemicals could be mixed and um, then the photograph had to be taken within a few minutes and then back into the dark room to develop and fix the photographs. Serious photographers had to use a wheelbarrow to carry the equipment or, or wealthy photographers even used a horse-drawn covered wagon. Just to make um, it clear how much effort was involved, you first had to have very clean glass plates. Then in the light, you could pour salted, that means uh, mixed with iodide or bromide, collodion onto the glass plate and you tilt it around so that the liquid reaches each corner. And then you pour the excess back into the bottle from one of the corners. Then you take the plate into the dark room. You could have a an orange tent um, as the plates were only sensitive to blue light. Then inside the tent, you would immerse the plate in silver nitrate for three to five minutes, lift the plate out of the bath, drain and wipe the back, put it into a plate holder, protect it from the light because it was now sensitive, with a dark slide, put that plate holder into the back of the camera. Then when you're ready to take the photograph, withdraw the dark slide, a dark plate from in front of the glass plate, expose the plate by taking a cover off the lens at the front and that could take anything from a few seconds to several minutes if it was dark. Um, then go back 
into the dark, develop the plate using ferrous sulfate developer, and then fix the plate either with potassium cyanide or sodium thiosulfate, the hypo I mentioned in the first talk. Incidentally, potassium cyanide, very dangerous to, uh, I think the fatal dose is something like 0.2 to 0.3 of a gram. So don't put your fingers in your mouth after you've developed and fixed the picture. And all of that had to be done in a few minutes. And that meant that the photographer had to carry all the chemicals around and the portable dark room wherever he went. Oh, and incidentally, the plate at the end had to be washed in fresh water. So you can see the tube for draining the water away coming out of the, the dark room there. So you had to carry or obtain the water as well. Oh, and finally, you dried the plate and varnished it to protect the delicate silver service surface. So here's an example of what you could do in the 1860s. This is a family photograph taken by Charles, Charles Dodgson, later better known by his pen name, Lewis Carroll. You know, in the 1850s, he was a scholar mathematician at Christ Church, Oxford. And in 1856, he discovered photography and soon excelled at the art and even considered making a living out of photography. Of course, if he had, we wouldn't have Alice in Wonderland or Through the Looking Glass as they were written in the 1860s and 1870s. He took photographs of many of the famous characters of the day and he was a particular friend of Dante Rossetti who you can see here on the left, sitting uh, or standing next to the seated Christina Rossetti, the poet, his mother, Francis Lavinia, and on the right, the his brother and art critic, William Michael. Now, the other great development during the 1850s. So I've been talking about um, the rise of the photographic shop and the process you had to go through to take photographs outside. The other great development was the carte de visite, which was a photographic visiting card with your portrait on it. And in France, portraits of Napoleon III made the carte de visite popular overnight. That's from about, I think it was 1859. And then two years later, the death of Prince Albert created an enormous demand for his carte de visite portrait um, from a, pictures that had been commissioned by Queen Victoria the previous year, which I, I'm showing you here. So the two combined this uh, popularity of the carte de visite and both France and Britain meant that the fashion for giving a carte de visite to your friends developed and everyone started visiting photographic shops to have these cards produced. The price dropped, they became quite cheap and the craze developed. It became so popular, it was called cardomania and um, a bit like collecting autographs, but in this case, you collected the carte de visites of famous people, and then you would put them in special albums and show your friends and family. It, it Incidentally, it meant the end of portrait miniatures, except very specialist uses, and artists went out of business, or many artists converted to photography. Now, it was common for families in the Victorian period to have lots of children and about a quarter to a third died before they were five. And so grief stricken parents were desperate to have something to remember their young child by. And in this photograph, the youngest child on the left has died and is propped up against a stand for the picture. To us, it may seem morbid, but of course we have many photographs of our loved ones. But in Victorian England, 
these photographs became a way of commemorating the dead and blunting the sharpness of grief. In images, they are unsettling and strangely poignant. Families pose with dead infants appear asleep. We have consumptive young ladies elegantly reclining. Um, Victorian life was suffused with death. There were epidemics like diphtheria, typhus, cholera, for which there was no vaccination and no um, no cure. Um, and also from 1861, when Prince Albert died, the Queen Victoria went into mourning and stayed in mourning virtually the rest of her life, making a mourning dress uh, fashionable. Changing the subject, though, photo photography was also used to uh, record foreign locations, and this was extremely popular as well. It was a form of armchair tourism. Remember, most people couldn't carry around photographic equipment. Um, the wealthy John Ruskin actually took a photographer with him when he went abroad with all of the equipment. Um, so buying photographs of um, foreign locations became extremely popular. Now, Calvert Richard Jones, the Reverend Calvert Richard Jones, uh, was a member of a wealthy family, became a mathematician and painter, best known for his seascapes, um, educated at Oriel College, Oxford, and moved in the same circles as Fox Talbot. Credited with taking the first photograph in Wales, uh, he didn't take up photography as an occupation, but he did take many photographs and he took his equipment on holiday to France and Italy. And he developed his own method, his own technique for taking panoramic photographs by overlapping images. Now, he used the colour type or Talbot type process, which initially its um, fame, if you like, its use spread through a network of family connections, friends and social contacts. And Jones was one of the expert calotypists, as they were called, of the 1840s. Uh, notice this is 1846, so it's a very early work for um, a photographer who had to take all of the... Um, equipment with him to take um, on his tour through France and Italy. Um, about this time actually, the in the 1850s, Thomas Cook, who began operating in Europe and giving tour or, or arranging tours around Europe in the 1850s, meant that um, the upper middle class families could tour around Europe, the, the so-called grand tour of the um, 18th century had, had died out. The first Thomas Tour Cook of Northern Europe ended with um, four days in Paris and <laughs> at an all-inclusive cost of £11. And the other way you could see foreign climbs, this was before the invention of the postcard, was the illustrated book, a sort of luxury item for armchair travellers. And um, it began to be replaced by views that had been taken by an increasing army of middle class tourists who could um, afford to take um, to, to buy pictures of the area and record their, um, where they had been. It wasn't until quite late, 1894, that the first picture postcards of popular destinations could be bought from any shop or kiosk, and that really opened it up because um, they were cheap, uh, they had a standard format, there was a selection of different pictures, they were readily available and so on. Uh, but that was much later in the century. Another example, 
um, but another photographer, a very well-known photographer, Francis Frith, perhaps the best-known photographer of travel pictures in the 19th and 20th century. He photographed the Middle East and as many towns, he claimed to have photographed all towns in the United Kingdom. He was a founding member of the Liverpool Photographic Society and he dedicated himself to photography entirely from 1855 onwards. And he's, his ambitious goal was to create a true record, and I quote him, far beyond anything that is in the power of the most accomplished artist to transfer to his canvas. And he took enormous trouble. This photograph is one of a series he took with a gigantic 20 by 16 inch glass plate camera that Frith took to Egypt. A huge, um, uh, heavy camera that needed to be transferred Boarded by web by wagon together with all the other equipment needed and all the chemicals needed to um, process such large plates. He first went to the Nile in the year before this in 1856 and extended his trip and went on to Palestine and Syria and kept a journal um, of all of the photographs that he took. He recorded everything. He complained about how difficult it was taking photographs and finding a good viewpoint, but he seems to have done well. He obviously took a lot of trouble. Um, he, he's, a, he's in fact praised for his ability to find a novel viewpoint, so he must um, have spent a long time moving his equipment ra around. The, um, the Ramesseum, by the way, I discuss in my talk on ancient Egyptian art. Now, when he finished his travels in the Middle East, he came back to the UK and opened the firm of Francis Frith & Co and became the world's first specialist photographic publisher. And he started his grand project to photograph every town and village in the United Kingdom. He started off travelling around, taking them himself, but later he hired people. He set up the first postcard company and within a few years he had 2,000 shops in the United Kingdom selling his postcards and continued in business until the 1970s, I think 1970, um, when a photographic um, historian said that the, the archive that had been built up um, was um, nationally important and he persuaded um, he managed to persuade the Rothmans the tobacco company to buy the entire Francis Frith archive which was relaunched in 1976 and um, then run as an independent business and has over 125,000 photographs of 7,000 cities towns and villages in the UK. Another use for photography was to record important events and buildings. And this is a photograph of the Great Exhibition in Hyde Park in 1851. Most of the photographs you'll see, I'll show you one next, are the Great Exhibition when it was re-erected near Sydenham two years later. But this is actually what it looked like in Hyde Park. If you can go to Hyde Park, uh, you can see um, a plaque describing the area that it took. The um, photographer Della Motte was an artist and photographer, uh, became professor at King's College, and he was commissioned to record the Crystal Palace by Sir Joseph Paxton, the um, uh, designer of the building, and to record its disassembly and its reassembly in Sydenham. It was published um, as uh, the uh, first book, um, or, or one of the first books, I should say, of photographic prints. 
And this is the one, the photograph I mentioned also by Delamote of the building after it had been reassembled at Sydenham. Incidentally, the original building in Hyde Park cost £150,000 to build. They charged £3 entry for men and £2 for women, uh, later reduced to just a shilling. Six million people visited, which was a third of the population of the country, and it made a profit, a profit of 186,000, and that money was used to fund the building of what are now the South Kensington Museums. It was rebuilt, as you see here in Sydenham, 50% larger, but this building costs 1.3 million compared to the 150,000, and it went vastly over budget, never repaid the debt, and only ever made a small profit, but a spectacular building. It built, burnt down in the 1930s. War photography, although the photographic equipment was large and cumbersome, it was used as early as the 1850s to document war scenes and one of the first was the Crimean War, 1853-56. to 56. Um, It is believed that many of the photographs like this one were staged, although when you think about it that's inevitable with the exposure times. They needed to hold the pose for a few minutes. Um, this is taken by Roger Fenton, one of the pioneering British photographers and one of the first, if not the first, war photographer. His father was wealthy and um, a banker and a member of parliament. He, Roger Fenton, obtained a degree in law um, but then became interested in painting and so he went to Paris and... Um, visited the Great Exhibition in Hyde Park, saw the photography being exhibited there and became interested, took up photography and he founded the Photographic Society, later the Royal Photographic Society, as early as 1853. And when the Crimean War started the following year, it grabbed the public's attention and Fenton was encouraged by his friend Prince Albert to go there and record what was happening. He stayed there for three months. He took his equipment, this is his assistant, in the um, wagon that was used to carry all the equipment there. And it's possible, we think the photographs he took were intended as propaganda to counter what was becoming uh, criticism of the war in the press. The the photographs, incidentally, were converted into woodblocks by a human being who carved the, the picture um, of the photograph and that enabled them to be printed in the Illustrated London News so that everybody could see them. He, incidentally, um, avoided photographs of the dead, the seriously injured, that is, the, the mutilated soldiers. And um, he himself uh, broke several ribs. He caught cholera, um, was seriously depressed by the carnage he saw, but managed to take, in those three months, 350 usable negatives, which were displayed in London on his return. He came into conflict later with other photographers as he was wealthy and because he didn't need to make money, he believed that photographers shouldn't soil themselves with the sin of exploiting the talent they had commercially. Uh, but of course, um, most photographers had to um, uh, make money from photography to, um, to, to pay for the bills. The, I've mentioned uh, taking photographs of holiday locations abroad, 
but um, there was also a business developed in photographs of the UK. In fact, it goes right back to the end of the 18th century with the, the picturesque movement initiated by William Gilpin in 1782. He published a book called Observations of the River Wye. And um, in fact, he challenged the basis of the Grand Tour. He was saying, um, when there's such wonderful rural views in Britain, why do people need to visit Europe? And um, picturesque views of Britain became popular and um, uh, books uh, like that produced by uh, Turner were produced with engravings based on the artist's artwork. Well, of course, later with photography that those um, views which were produced by artists at the beginning of the century could be produced by uh, photographers. And um, here's an example uh, by the River Wye of the ruins of Tintern Abbey. Um, and this is actually a lantern slide. People would um, give uh, lantern slide tours of the country and in fact tours of abroad uh, to groups of people in halls around the country. The uh, holidays became particularly holidays in Britain, became more and more popular in the 19th century. The other use of photography was um, as a documentary record of everyday life. A very good book I recommend, uh, still available, was produced in 1877 by John Thompson uh, called Street Life in London. And he spent travel 10 years traveling around taking photographs in the Far East, but then returned to London, joined with Adolf Smith, who was a journalist, and their project was to photograph the street life of the London poor. And not only did they take photographs, all of them with the people's permission, but they also interviewed the person in depth. And the book contains some wonderful uh, photographs, but also wonderful descriptions of what it was like to uh, live in Victorian London as a um, relatively poor person. Or in some cases, extremely poor person. This costermonger, by the way, Joseph Carney, um, it goes into his entire business. He had to hire the barrow for 18 pence a week. He had to keep an eye out for the police who would confiscate the barrow. And if they did, they would charge a shilling a day for storage um, and fine him. And um, he brought, he, he, each day he would buy a barrel of 500 fresh herrings for 25 shillings, sell the largest 200 for a penny each and the smaller fish for a halfpenny and hoped by the end of the day, if he sold them all, he'd make a profit of four shillings and two pence. So uh, um, I mention all of those figures just to show the the level of detail that they went in that they go into in the book, describing exactly exactly how people lived at the time, including people like this. This um, woman is a was known as a crawler. A crawler was a beggar who was so poor and weak from hunger that she had to rely on beggars to give her food. And begging in the Victorian period was regarded by the beggars who the, um, uh, they interviewed as a profession. They had techniques they would use and they would expect to make a certain amount of money of the day. And at the end of the day, the crawlers they would um, perhaps give a, a halfpenny or a farthing to. A lot of them, uh, like this woman, were middle class people who had fallen on hard times. And this woman looked after a baby all day to enable the um, mother of the baby to work in return for a cup of tea, which she didn't always get. I asked the question, 
in the last talk is photography art and we've seen the various ways that um, it was approached in the Victorian period and the enormous proliferation of uses of photography and many photographs that were taken I think like this one um, are regarded today as would be regarded today are, 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 are artistic. The um, documentation of London life his, his book, Street Life in London, um, became popular. And as I said, it's in fact, it's available today on Amazon. Let's return to photography to produce, specifically to produce artistic images. The previous picture you saw was documenting the poor of London, but it did as many did, many photographers did, produce an artistic image. But there were many photographers who set out specifically to create a work of fine art. And in the late 19th century into the 20th century, there was a fine art photography movement called pictorialism and this is a, a perfect example of pictor pictorialism. It started perhaps as early as the 1850s when there was an English artist William John Newton who suggested art photography could be artistic but the the high point of pictorialism was from about 1885 to 1915 and it became an international photographic style that dominated art photography over that period. And it's difficult actually to define. There was typically manipulation of the image. They used soft focus, as Julia Margaret Cameron did earlier. They often made composite images. They even would use a, a brush um, to, to put brush strokes onto the image to add to the effect. It was influenced by painting, fine art painting, such as Impressionism and the Pre-Raphaelites. Um, and it pushed, it, the idea was that photographers should push the boundaries and it led to great innovation. The, the aim was to create a mood. Now, um, the, the name pictorialism is derived from a book Henry Peach Robinson's book Pictorial Effects in Photography of 1869 and um, Peter Henry Emerson the photographer of, who took this picture um, also uh, produced a book of his pictures Naturalistic Photography and that that book influenced a generation of photographers internationally it, it transformed the debate about photography and led rapidly led to the acceptance, widespread acceptance of photography as an art form. And, and many art galleries started to purchase photographs as works of art. Another example, different uh, photographer, James Wellington. And Henry Peach Robinson founded something called the Brotherhood of the Linked Ring and many of the famous pictorialists were members of the linked ring, like um, James Wellington. Membership grew by invitation only. Um, others we'll see later was Frank Sutcliffe was a member, um, Frederick Hollier, um, Alfred Hinton and so on. So it, it was a growing but slowly growing society and the linked ring was at the forefront of the movement of pictorialism and was regarded as the leaders in creating um, photographic art. They held in 1893 um, a, an annual uh, or a photographic exhibition that was continued annually after that and its aim was to exhibit images in which there's a distinct evidence of personal feeling and execution. As I said, to uh, the aim was to manipulate the photograph, combine photographs to create a mood. 
the 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 linked ring by the way was um uh, three that they their logo was three interlinked rings which were meant in part to represent the masonic beliefs of good true and beautiful which is what they saw their photographs as being uh, George Davison, a uh, co-founder of the Linked Ring, uh, became managing director of Kodak and a millionaire, thanks to the fact that he made an early investment in Kodak. He was originally from a poor family in Lowestoft, uh, had a good education, joined the Camera Club and the Royal Photographic Society, where he started to exhibit. He was influenced by Peter Emerson, turned away from naturalism and um, was one of the first photographers to use a pinhole camera. Uh, a pinhole camera has doesn't have a lens, it has a just a tiny pinhole in the front of the camera. Exposure times are extremely long but the benefit is because it's such a tiny hole the I don't want to get too technical, but the depth of field, that is the range of things that were in focus, stretched from almost next to the camera to infinity. Here, in the onion field, it, it's difficult to see in this reproduction, but he used rough paper to print on to create the effect of a painting. As I said, they experimented, they tried lots of different things. And this photograph, the onion field, is considered the first impressionistic photograph. His paintings were uh, criticised. Um, he uh, had to, he, well, he left the Royal Photographic Society. George Eastman offered him a position of director in the in the UK in 1889 and he joined the company and um, or he, he was already a member of the, uh, the, the, the Eastman company and he organised exhibitions which were extremely popular. 25,000 people attended one. He was promoted, he became um, a senior director and um, um, a main director of Eastman Kodak in the UK. And as I said, he'd invested in the company as well and so became a millionaire. Eventually, though, in 1908, he started to uh, have sympathy with and to join, link himself to social reformists and anarchists. And Eastman asked him to resign, which he did in 1908. And he, he retired, and moved to North Wales and then to the south of France. Sutcliffe, I mentioned just now, Francis Sutcliffe. This is his most famous photograph. It's called Water Rats. Uh, it caused some little comment at the time as it features naked children playing in a boat but the image isn't erotic and he followed the conventions of ap the academic nude um, paintings were being made at the time very similar to this however he was uh, excommunicated by his local clergy for displaying it on the grounds that they thought it would corrupt the opposite sex Another pa painting by him, he um, lived for most of his life in Whitby. This is a photograph of Whitby Bay. He was a um, very prolific photographer, uh, took many photographs of landscapes and of people, um, contributed to periodicals, wrote a regular col column in the Yorkshire Weekly Post. Here we see his skill at controlling light. I think this must have been assembled from multiple images uh, taken using different exposure times because uh, we see detail in the cloud as well as we see detail in the shadow areas like the boat's keel. Um, that can only be done. The um, range of exposures that the emulsions were capable of wasn't sufficient for that. And even today um, we have problems with um, mobile phones taking photographs, but um, modern phones can achieve the same effect by taking very rapidly a series of photographs 
with different exposures and then digitally combining them together. It's a similar thing to what Sutcliffe did. Which brings me to the end of my talk. This is the final image, Three Happy Boys, um, again by Sutcliffe. Um, a photographic artist, I'd call him, and he recorded an enduring record of life in the seaside town of Whitby and the surrounding area. Area. He was born in Leeds and um, he did um, uh, for a while live um, south of London in Tunbridge Wells but then spent the rest of his life in Whitby in Yorkshire. Uh, his father was a painter and he introduced him to John Ruskin so he was well connected. He resented um, taking photographs of holiday makers. He wanted to uh, take the photographs of um, the, the people and the landscapes and the images that he was interested in. And doing that, he built up one of the most complete and revealing collections of photographs of late Victorian England. Which brings me to the end of my talk. It's um, the end of the 19th century, in the 20th century, uh, photography blossomed in many different directions. We have um, famous art photographers like Alfred Stieglitz, Edward um, Steichen, Man Ray, Alexander Rodchenko, Dorothea Lang, Ansel Adams, of course, Cecil Beaton, uh, each one of them deserving a talk on their own. But that's all for now. Thank you for your time and um, goodbye for now.